it's an incredible challenge to, to human understanding to try and make sense of this. And I started out, you know, reading Jung, doing my Hindu, you know, getting up to speed with all that, studying Zen Buddhism, studying shamanism. The thing that puzzles me about DMT is how little trace there is of it in the human world. I can't point to a period in European art or the art of some group of islanders somewhere and say that is very much like DMT. It isn't. And yet the DMT thing is it's like an avalanche of orgasmic beauty but a certain kind of beauty. The only words that I can find for the kind of beauty that it is is bizarre, alien, outlandish, outre, freaky, and at the very edge of what the human mind seems to be able to hold. Well, where is this coming from? And what is happening? And, and this is what I like to discuss with people such as yourselves who have wide experience in the world and in the realms of the unseen. This has to be taken seriously. In other words, the it's only a hallucination thing. That horseshit is just passe. I mean, reality is only a hallucination for crying out loud. Haven't you heard? So that takes care of that. It's only a hallucination. What we've got here, folks, is an intelligent entelechy of some sort that is frantic to communicate with human beings for some reason. And uh, the possibilities can be logically enumerated. I mean, what we've got here is either this is an extraterrestrial, you know, evolved in a, around a different star, possibly with a different biology, may not even be made of matter, came across an enormous distance sometime, maybe long ago, has some agenda which we may or may not be able to conceive of. This is it, the real thing, as the little girl said in Poltergeist, they're here. So that's one possibility. That's just one possibility. Uh, and I, I present these without judgment because I'm not sure. Uh, uh, if an extraterrestrial wanted to interact with a human society and it had ethics that forbade it from landing trillion-ton beryllium ships on the United Nations Plaza. In other words, if it were subtle, I can see hiding yourself inside a shamanic intoxication. You would say, let's analyze these people. Okay, they're kind of hard-headed rationalists, except they have this phenomenon called getting loaded. And when they get loaded, they accept whatever happens to them. So let's hide inside the load and we'll talk to them from there. And they'll never realize that we're of a different status than pink elephants. Okay, that's one possibility. Now, another possibility is that this is not about extraterrestrials flight and enormous technologies and distant homelands that, uh, and this is maybe closer to friendlier to pagan notions, that there is a parallel continuum nearby, essentially right here, and call it fairyland, call it the western realm, whatever you like, but you don't go there in starships you go there through magical doorways which are opened via ritual and, uh, and things like that. That is a possibility as well. Certainly human folklore in all times and places except Western Europe for the last 300 years has insisted that these parallel domains of intelligence and, and uh, uh, organization exist. There is a third 
possibility, which I leave it to you to decide whether this is the more conservative position or the more radical position. And I reached this reluctantly, and I'm not sure this is my position, but uh, these things have a weird, these tykes, as I call them, these self-transforming machine elves, these, these syntactical homunculi, have a very weird relationship to human beings. First of all, they love us. They care for some reason. Wh whoever and whatever they are, they're far more aware of us than we are aware of them. I mean, witness the fact that they welcome me. Uh, so, is it possible that at the end of the 20th century, at the end of 500 years of materialism, reductionism, positivism, what we're about to discover is probably the least likely denouement any of us expected out of our dilemma. What we're about to discover is that death has no sting. That what you penetrate on DMT is an ecology of human souls in another dimension of some sort. I mean, this is hair-raising to me, and I spent my whole adolescence and early adulthood getting free from uh, Catholicism and its assumptions, and I never imagined that a thorough exploration of life's mysteries would lead to the conclusion that, in fact, uh, this is but a prelude. We are in a very tiny womb of some sort. Our lives are gestations, and this is not where we are destined to unfold ourselves into what it means to be human. This is some kind of a metamorphic stage, uh, like the pupa of a butterfly. And so, uh, th this is deep water. Because, you know, we are fairly agitated over the fact that we fear the planet is dying and us with it. This stuff raises the issue that you don't know what dying is. Therefore, it's very uncertain exactly what sort of an attitude we should take to it. And as I say, I am not advocating a position Mysteries are not unsolved problems. They are mysteries. When you stand naked in the presence of the mystery, it is still utterly and completely mysterious. But I enjoy talking to people about this because I think that the human body, the human mind, these are tools for the soul to use in the effort to unlock its meaning and its destiny. And uh, millions of people, perhaps billions of people, have gone to the grave without knowing that this is possible, this experience that I've just described to you. And it's perfectly harmless. I mean, I think that if science would uh, back out of politics and do its work, we could establish that DMT is the most harmless, the safest of all hallucinogens. The fact that it occurs naturally in the human brain is the first clue to its, the fact that it's benign. The second clue is the fact that uh, it only lasts eight to twelve minutes. What that means to a pharmacologist is the body perfectly understands what to do with this compound. You take a hit of DMT and your body says, oh, I recognize this. Uh, activate deanimation cycle, activate demethylation cycle, activate... It knows what to do. And so within ten minutes you're down. Uh, uh, a drug that you take 
and 48 hours later you're lying around in warm baths and refusing telephone calls is a drug you shouldn't have taken uh, be, because it's hitting you too hard that's not it's not clean it's not smooth DMT the most powerful hallucinogen known to man and science clears your system in 15 minutes I mean you're so down you can't you don't have a small headache or need to take a nap or anything you're ready to do phone calls um, so how can it be then that a compound which each of us carries right here right in the pineal gland right in the Ajna chakra the philosopher's stone is no further away than that how can this be secret from us how can we be trapped in a dimension of such limitation and such mundaneness when our own nervous systems and the ecology around us and our own history over the past half million years argues that this is what we were born and bred for this is where we belong this is what at play in the fields of the goddess must mean and somehow history has uh, made us dysfunctional buried the mystery made it uh, uh, if at best a piece of secret knowledge jealously guarded by somebody I mean I don't know there are lots of mystery cults and secret societies in the world I don't know if any of them are guarding DMT as a secret I, I it may be so no one told me to keep my mouth shut uh, if a, a very suggestive short story I'm sure many of you know and love the the Argentine surrealist writer Jorge Luis Borges well Borges has a book I believe it's called labyrinths and in labyrinths there is a short story called the sect of the Phoenix and it says there is a sacrament older than mankind the sectarians have been the victims of every persecution in human history and the sectarians have been the purveyors of every persecution in history these sectarians are not identifiable by race or place or language or time to the adept the mystery appears ridiculous yet they do not speak of it one child can initiate another it is orange ruins are propitious places do it in the moonlight in the threat at, at the thresholds of buildings and that's all it said it's a page and a half and it suggests and and see here's the thing I, I mean I am not as articulate on this subject as I wish I could be if this is not the secret that these lineages are guarding then they're guarding an empty house this is the secret it is it is it cannot be anything else it is the neoplatonic one it is the transubstantiant object the panis supersubstantialis of the alchemist and it's and and I'm not saying that people have known about this for a long time uh, DMT is in many plants as I said but spread very thinly and we don't have historical records of anyone ever concentrating it I've done the DMT uh, plant preparations of the Amazon the snuffs and the ayahuasca and on ayahuasca if it is heavily laced with the DMT containing plant after hours of breath work and drumming alone in the jungle you can begin to open it up to the place the DMT will carry you to in 45 seconds in an Upper East Side apartment uh, whether you like it or not
some of you may have seen, I don't, years and years ago, this B movie about a guy who has a big ranch in Mexico, and one of the campesinos comes rushing back from having encountered a brontosaur in the forest, and he can only point inarticulately at the woods and say, something, 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 something. <clears throat> And that's what I am. I'm a monkey. And I've come back to the truth. And I'm telling you, there's something over the next hill that is off the scale. Off the scale. And I have made it my business to, you know, delve. I'm a delver. I'm a noetic archaeologist. Uh, I, obscure heresies and strange rites and all of this stuff, been there, done that. It's all pale soup compared to this. And so I, I hype it to you simply to try and inspire you to explore it. We are at the present state in the position of explorers of the new world 50 years after Columbus. We have notebook entries. We have partial maps, but we don't have a complete map of what this thing is. It's another dimension. It is literally another dimension. I took uh, DMT to a, a llama of great accomplishment, not one of the grab-ass can of Budweiser welded to the good right hand llamas, but a real llama. This guy was over 90 when he smoked DMT, and uh, he sensed his wheel has turned. Uh, and he said to me, he said, it's the lesser lights. He said, you can't go further into the bardo and return. And so I think that we stand at the brink of an enormous frontier Call it incorporeality, call it non-material existence, or, you know, bite the bullet. Call it death. But this is the frontier that we stand on the edge of. This is what history has been about. History has been some kind of suicide plot for 15,000 years. Not a moment passed that the plot was not advanced closer and closer and closer and closer to completion. And now in the 20th century, you know, we see that this thing, this transcendental object at the end of time, this attractor has been, that chose us out of the animal kingdom and sculpted the neocortex, opposed the thumb, stood us on our hind legs, gave us binocular vision. This thing is calling us toward itself across eons of cosmic time. We are asked to mirror it, and as we mirror it, we become more of its essence. And as we become more of its essence, we leave behind the animal organization that we were uh, cast in in the beginning. And what this is about who knows? You know, is this a drama of cosmic redemption? Is it uh, uh, the transcendental other at the end of time? Is it a Gnostic demon? Is it Il Dabwa? What is it? We do not know. But I really believe we are in the era when we will come to know. And what the psychedelics are, are periscopes in the temporal dimension. If you want to see a little bit into the future, elevate your psychedelic periscope outside of the three-dimensional continuum and peer around for thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. We have been pulled toward this omega point. The earth is like an egg. It has come to its moment of fructification. The dawn that has been anticipated since we were herding our cattle across the plains of Africa is now upon us. 
The east is streaked with the blush of rosy dawn. It is coming upon us. And I think that it will redeem history, that history is not a nightmare. It is a passage. It is an initiation. Think of the fetus in the womb at the moment of transition. Surely it must despair. The walls are closing in. It's being crushed and strangled. Gone are the endless amniotic oceans of a few months before. The weightlessness, the effortless delivery of food through the umbilical cord. Suddenly, it's just boundaries and agony and crushing pressure. That's where we are. And we are going to have to shed history like a snake sheds its skin if we want to slip off into hyperspace where I think all of magical humanity is awaiting us and cheering us on, lending their weight. They're all out there, you know, Proclus and Plotinus and Plato and Hypatia and Henry Cornelius Agrippa and John Dee and Robert Flood and Eliaphas Levy. They're all out there pulling for us. And every shaman and shamaness, every magician, practitioner, as far back in time as you go, was part of the plan, the conjuration, the great work, the distillation of the quintessence. It, history is a magical invocation. And at the end of that invocation, if it is correctly done, all boundaries will dissolve into the stone, the lapis, a trans-dimensional vehicle that can move through space and time, that is the collectivity of all human souls free at last in what William Blake called the divine imagination. And you don't have to wait for the general dispensation. You can join up any time by hyperspatializing your metaphors and your point of view through psychedelic symbiosis with the plants that are pouring this hyperdimensional Gaian vision into the minds of anyone who will detoxify themselves from history and, uh, and linear thinking and but open themselves to the presence of the transformative mystery that is going to leave this planet unrecognizable to us within our lifetimes.